Thanks for you all that are joining. And thank you for those of you that have already sent in your questions. Um, this is uh, not trying to um, tell anybody that they should sure. or shouldn't take the vaccine. What we're trying to do is give you information and then allow you to go and make your own decision from that. We're going to get quite a, quite a large cross-section. We have asked them to be as impassionate as as possible and or dispassionate and to just give us the facts as they know them. We're only asking them to um, talk from what they know. This is not a conversation about is COVID real um, or how it came into being. We'll all have a view on that. We have to deal with what's here now. Um, and we've asked them to look at it, not just only from their medical and research perspective, but also from the, the spiritual aspect as well, being Christians, all of them. So God bless you today. Um, and if I can hand over to the well-being team, Sister Renee or Sister Melissa, whoever now, God bless you in Jesus' name. God bless you, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and thank you, Overseer. Um, I'm going to start by saying that this, this session will be recorded. Um, and um, but don't worry, those who are pinned, so just the five of us who are on the panel and asking the questions will be shown in the recording. So you can have your videos on or choose to take them off, that's fine. You will not be see seen in the recording. But I do ask that everybody make sure that they are muted and that they stay on mute throughout the duration of this session. Um, I first want to greet um, the bishop, any pastors, officers, saints in Christ, I greet you all and I welcome you all in Jesus' name. So today we're discussing a topic that has received mixed opinions, it has caused much confusion, genuine worry and anticipation, and some really important questions. And we're talking about co the COVID-19 vaccine, or rather vaccines. Um, and it's important for me to start by saying that this session, as Overseer has already said, um, is not to persuade you to take the vaccine. It's to <laughs> persuade you to not take the vaccine. It's to have an informed discussion using a variety of perspectives, spiritual, uh, racial, psychological, and medical, providing facts only and never inserting our own individual opinions. The choice is yours. And I want to reiterate that it's not the place of the church either to criticize or judge whatever you decide to do. Um, there should be no shame or shaming. Our only hope is that you need this discussion <laughs> feeling um, better educated so that you can make an informed decision for yourself. One of the things that I've been thinking about as it pertains to, to Bethel, and I'm sure we have other churches here as well, is not only the spiritual concerns, but also the fact that we are um, a black majority church. That is a fact. I an mean, understanding that there is a history of medical racism that many of us have experienced or, or are familiar with. Um, we've, we've heard statistics, um, you know, for black women in childbirth, that they're five times more likely to die than their white counterparts. We've heard that black men are 50% more likely to be diagnosed with a mental illness compared to white men. I mean, considering the fact that there are these racial disparities within healthcare, the essential question that stems from that is how can the NHS or healthcare regain the trust of our communities when we've been exposed to a long history of medical raci racism? And so with the, with the racial concerns, the spiritual concerns, physical and psychological concerns, I'm asking the panel to treat every question with a level of compassion and understanding. No question is, or concern is, is, is valid, invalid, sorry. This disease is novel, it's new. And so it's important that these questions are answered with care and consideration of all the views and concerns. Um, as Overseer has already stated, this session is being hosted by the Bethel Central Wellbeing Team. Two of our members are on the panel. And before I get to the, the panel members, I want to briefly um, just share with you our mission statement, which is to advance knowledge on and demystify the stigmas surrounding physical, mental and spiritual health by promoting a holistic approach to wellness in the church. And we believe that healthy bodies and minds, i.e. souls, are essential for the body and mind of Christ. And in turn, we recognize that all encompassing well-being practices can foster spiritual growth. Um, so as I, as I stated before, and as Overseer has already stated, there are two members of the Bethel Central Wellbeing team, two trained medical professionals. 
Dr. Carol and Dr. Mike. And they, along with Sister Sandra, will be the ones answering your questions today. So I'm going to head over to, to the panelists and I'm just going to introduce them and their credentials. We have missionary Dr. Carol Igafose from the Leicester Assembly. Dr. Carol is a general medical practitioner, currently working as a sessional GP with leadership roles, including clinical lead and clinical supervisory roles. Dr. Carol's clinical experience in secondary care includes acute medical medicine, um, diabetes care, care of the elderly, gastroenterology, stroke, psychiatry, pediatrics, obstetrics, and gynecology. I'm really happy that I got through those terms. Um, Dr. Carroll has also worked in medical research with a focus on asthma, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. She's also the author of the book, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made, The Heart of the Matter, and she's the founder and director of Liddy Limited. We also have Dr. Michael Dawes. Dr. Mike Dawes has a bachelor's degree from Manchester Metropolitan University in biomedical science. He also has a master's in medicine um, from the Medical University of Plovdiv. He's currently a senior house officer at Shrewsbury Hospital in Shropshire and has also worked as a funeral director, as a healthcare assistant, a radiology assistant, and a biomedical scientist in histopathology. And while she's not directly a part of the Bethel Central wellbeing team, we are also honoured to have Sister Sandra Simmons-Goken joining us in this conversation as her experience and expertise is crucial to this topic. Um, Sister Sandra is a member of the church in Wellington and is a registered general nurse in the NHS working since 1985, so just over 35 years of service. Um, she has a bachelor's degree with honours in public health, along with two diplomas, one in asthma and the other in occupational health. She's a qualified occupational health advisor, school nurse and disability assessor. And she's currently undertaking two jobs, one as a, as a nurse COVID vaccinator. So as you can tell by their credentials, by their buyers, that they are well equipped to be having this conversation with, with all of us today. And we're going to make a start. Our panel are gonna start by delivering short, five to 10 minute presentations. And then straight after that, we're going to dive into the all important questions. So I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Carol Igafose, who's going to deliver the first presentation, which offers an overview on COVID-19 and the vaccine. Over to you, Dr. Carol. Thank you very much, Sister Rene. Good afternoon, everybody. God bless you. Thank you very much for tuning in. So I will just quickly go through uh, what we intend to cover this afternoon. Bear with me, let me open my slides. Okay, so we just want to just briefly look at SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, the course of the COVID-19 disease, managing COVID-19, looking at the vaccines in terms of the trials, how the vaccines work, looking at vaccines safety and efficacy, exploring some information and myths, looking at our responsibilities, then looking, summarizing the information, and of course, we will have our Q&A. Um, so this is a pandemic story as it is. We're still in it. Uh, towards the end of 2019, we heard of a novel coronavirus uh, which emerged. It was later named by the WHO, the World Health Organization, as SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus Number 2. The disease that it's caused is called COVID-19, which is an acronym for coronavirus infectious disease number 19, depicting the year when it was isolated. In January of 2020, scientists in China sequenced the gene and of the virus. And as a result, we have information which has brought us to where we are now, i.e. being able to come up with a vaccine. The World Health Organization, as I said in February, named the virus and the disease. And in 2020, a pandemic was declared. The story so far is that this has continued. Today, we have over 116 million people who have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. <laughs> We've had over almost 2.3 deaths, unfortunately. In the UK, we've had over 4, 4 million infections and the death rate is also quite high. Unfortunately, uh, well, fortunately, the death rate is, is going down, even though it is still high. 
today the number or yesterday the number was 236 people who died from the disease by the way it is calculated. We're concerned at the moment um, that there are variants that have emerged that have implications for how the disease progresses or the pandemic progresses. And we're, we're seeing three variants of concern, one in England, one emerged in South Africa and another in Brazil. The pandemic, I must say, has different effects in different parts of the world concurrently. So for example, here in, in, in England, we've got the vaccine and we seem to be coming out of a lockdown. We've got a roadmap. However, in Jamaica, they're at the stage where they are just about closing down and no restrictions are being placed on things like church services, only 10 people are allowed, funeral um, attendees are being restricted. We've sort of gone through that, but this is the way it is. It's affecting, it's at different phases, phases in the world. And more so, Jamaica has not yet started their vaccination program. So that has implications for how the pandemic will here. This SARS-CoV-2 virus, this is a picture of it. Like I said, it's been isolated. Two features that are key is the spike protein, which is on the surface of the vaccine. And that is what has been isolated and is targeted for use in the vaccines. It is also worth known, knowing that the, the genetics uh, of the vaccine is, is an RNA and that has been isolated and is being used to much advantage as well. The course of the disease go through phases and Dr. Mike will take us through this some more. There are also different drugs that have been isolated and are also being used. In addition, we're told um, that some supplements and food might work. There have not been uh, research to show that these actually prevent or, or, or stop the disease, but we do know from time that things like or lemon, ginger, turmeric, uh, garlic have some sort of anti-inflammatory qualities and have in the past helped, especially with our simple respiratory diseases, as they are not known to cause any problem. There's no problem carrying on with these, but we shouldn't think that these will cure the disease because it hasn't shown to do so. We luckily uh, or thankfully have some vaccines that have emerged. The vaccines that are currently available are slightly different from the traditional vaccines, which we're accustomed to. But needless to say, we currently have three vaccines that are uh, authorized for use in the UK. And um, just two things that people seem to be very concerned about is whether the vaccine contain fetal tissues. The answer to that is no, but there are, Fetal cell lines have been used to develop some of the vaccines. That's something we can explore a little bit further in the Q&A. And as to whether or not the vaccine contain tracking devices, the answer is no. I think Sister Sandra will have a problem injecting something with a tracking device using that very tiny needle, but you can rest assured that that hasn't, doesn't contain tracking devices. So, the clinical trials um, are something that people talk about a lot because we know that traditionally vaccines take up to 15, sometimes 20 years to come to market where they are approved for use in human beings. And in 10 months, we've had a number of vaccines, in fact, three vaccines, and now the Johnson & Johnson one is coming to four. So we'll have four. In fact, there are others that have been ready in this short phase um, space of time. And so individuals have asked the question as to whether or not the clinical trials have been rushed and whether the vaccines are safe. The vaccines have not, um, the, the process for developing the vaccines have not um, differ. They have gone through all the stages that traditionally um, all vaccines would go through. <clears throat> Sorry. Some work had been done preclinically, and as a result of that, that shortened phase. One of the big things in developing vaccines is manufacturing and generally things that money can take care of. Because we've had a pandemic, there has been a lot of collaboration between government, 
um, different countries, different uh, organizations. And as a result, things that money would normally cause a, a, a delay for have not been an issue. People have been willing to put money forward for the manufacturing to go forward whilst the, pre, the, the different phases are, are going through. So they didn't have to wait for phase one to complete and phase three before we start manufacturing vaccines that we need. Everything was happening concurrently. There was lots of collaboration. And as a result, we have vaccines that have gone through all the traditional stage, stages, be it at a shorter time. And we have data to show that the vaccines are safe and effective. Safety and efficacy are two of the main things that we expect to gain once a vaccine is developed. So the three vaccines you can see, I've noticed them. The difference, primarily difference is the price. The AstraZeneca is much reasonably priced because they've made a commitment not to make any profit from the vaccine. The AstraZeneca, sorry, the Pfizer-BioNTech one is priced at $20, uh, 15 pounds. And the, the Moderna is the one that is most expensive. Another difference is the way they are stored. Uh, the, the AstraZeneca can be kept in normal refrigerator uh, refrigerators, whereas the other two require much higher temperature. And that is because of how they are made. But that has implications for how they are, uh, they are used throughout the world. Because as you can imagine, some countries will not have the, uh, the facilities to store vaccines at the high temperatures that are um, indicated for Pfizer, for example. The vaccines that are in use are, like I said, slightly different from traditional vaccines. We have, for the first time in human history, vaccines that are referred to as genome, uh, genetic vaccines. So we have a vaccine that, uh, RNA vaccines and DNA vaccines. And we also have vaccine, uh, the, the Oxford AstraZeneca one that is used uh, using an animal vector to have the vaccine. So that's referred to as a adenovirus uh, vaccine. We're going to more of that necessary, if, if necessary later. So just some more information from the trials. I won't go through the details, but what I wanted to show in these slides is that there have been over 70,000 individuals that were, the vaccines were trialed on by the time we came to the end of the phase three. So we had preclinical phase one, phase two, phase three. So that's a, a large number of individuals and enough was done to show that the vaccines are safe and effective. I'm not going to go through the details at this point, we can discuss that more in the Q&A session. I've put this slide up and this picture up just to remind us that when we talk about, when we give information, particularly about this subject, it is important that we're talking about, we're giving information that is robust, that has been tested and not just talking from hearsay. When I tell you something as a doctor, unless it has gone through uh, studies and trials, we refer to that as an expert opinion. And even that is at the base of this pyramid. So when you get something from what on WhatsApp, for example, I just want you to think, how robust is this information? Is this tried and tested information? The information that we get that you can test and try uh, on the government website, for example, on the NHS website, those have gone through trials and the information that is presented is as a result of trials that have been tested. And so I can only tell you that that's the case. And in that case, those are the sort of information that we should be depending on rather than any sort of ad hoc information. Certain myths and, um, that we need to just address how, would, how might we react to the vaccine? And Nurse Sandra will tell us a little bit more about that and maybe give us some tips as to how to deal with the vaccine. And um, just to say that the card that we get is used for the reminder of the second dose and not necessarily as a, as a passport or a proof of vaccine, but 
that's something that we need to watch the space as to how things will develop because there will might be into implications for future quote unquote vaccine passport. Will we be forced to have the vaccine? It is not mandatory in England, but again, that's something we can talk a little bit more about. And just to say that having had the vaccine, it is not time to go out and return to normal. It does take a while for the immunity to develop. So we do need to continue practicing face, face, hands, and don't forget ventilation. It's very, very important. There are long, there might be long-term side effects that we're not aware of, but again, we'll discuss that further because there are still some unknowns, but it is worth saying that a lot of studies are being undertaken because we are very keen to get as much information and a lot of resources are being put into getting information. Should Christians take the vaccine? That's a personal decision. But I just want to remind us that we have a responsibility, not just to ourselves. Uh, one of the scientists that I heard speak uh, said that uh, to take the vaccine is can be considered community responsibility. You can take that as, as you were, uh, you know, as you would like. But the, the fact is that there is something called herd immunity. And I've put this herd of sheep here to depict that. If that sheep in the middle is unable to have the vaccine for whatever reason, but all the others around it have, have had the vaccine, then they will act as a roadblock, as it were for the vaccine to get to that sheep, that vulnerable sheep in the middle. Because having had the vaccine, the aim is that it will, if not totally prevent us getting the infection, at least prevent us from getting a severe form of the infection ending up in hospital. And as Christians, we do have our ammunition of the word of God, which we use to make our decisions and prayer, which is also very valid. Um, Summarizing, just to remind us that this virus is still present, the disease is still here, still causing severe uh, infections or severe disease and death, and we've got the variants that are emerging. We've learned a lot, um, but there are still ongoing studies, and there's an abundance of data to support the, the safety and efficacy of the vaccines, but like I said, there are still unknowns. The reason why we take the vaccination is that we believe that it will, having take the vaccine, it will trigger our immune system to respond and produce antibodies and activate other immune system cells that will fight the virus and protect us from the infection and the disease should we in the future be exposed to the actual virus. We must do our part to access credible information about COVID-19 and the vaccines. Remember that safe doesn't mean that there is no side effects, but risk is different from being risky. When I get in my car and drive, I'm taking a risk. And that's a necessary risk that I have to take in order to get on with day-to-day -day lives. But I'm not gonna do something that will directly put my life at risk. That's a safe analogy. So as we continue in this pandemic story, it's down to all of us and we will all decide how this story will end. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Carol, for that comprehensive summary or overview of, of COVID-19 and the vaccines. Um, we're gonna have a, a short presentation now from Dr. Mike followed by um, a short, a short um, overview or discussion from Nurse Sandra before we get into our questions. But now Dr. Mike is going to discuss the patient's journey uh, with COVID-19. Praise the Lord, everyone. Um, so my name is Dr. Mike, as you are all aware. Um, so basically, I have been working with COVID from the beginning, from the time when there was only two individuals that came into the country with COVID, and we were started off doing uh, assessment pods. So I was, and initially, I was 
testing people if they thought they had symptoms after calling them 111. Then after that, it got too vast. And so um, there was the first wave and I was working within the first wave on COVID wards directly when we didn't know much about the virus, it was all new. And then from there, I've, I'm still to this day working on coronavirus wards. And to this day, I've never had coronavirus, to God be the glory. Um, but I'm going to take you through a journey, a patient's journey through COVID. And I don't know if it's the Lord's uh, was doing for this purpose. Um, I was a family, uh, would say a patient's relative to someone with COVID. My mother had COVID. So I got to experience it from a relative's point of view. I mean, working as a doctor, sometimes you, you, you can kind of shut off to how things go on because you get so used to it. But I experienced it from another side very recently. So here we have it. So COVID-19. So first you have your incubation period. It's between two and 14 days, averaging of five days. So obviously you come into a room or into contact with somebody. As we know, it's aerosol born, airborne. So coughing, sneezing, talking, singing, so forth. The virus is spread. And in two to 14 days, you will start to develop symptoms unless you are asymptomatic. So the, the day you develop symptoms is classed as day zero of your infection. If you test positive, it's from that day that you can calculate. So the common symptoms that you normally will face is a high temperature of 38.1 and above, some people go to 39. Uh, a new onset of cough, a loss of taste and smell, muscle aches, rigors, which is like shaking, diarrhea, headache, sore throat, or even shortness of breath. This is in the initial phase. Moving on. Okay, so the initial phase is fine. We, we deal with it like it's a normal flu. We take paracetamol for when not. We have a temperature. We drink our lem sip and so forth. And everything seems nice and, and hanky-dory. So I'm going to explain with my mom as a patient also. So my mother, she was with COVID. She tested positive on, uh, she gave me, she told me on the Thursday. Yeah, she felt the cough and everything. And she, she had the fevers and going forth. Knowing what I know, I was like, first week is fine. That's great. But there comes what we, what we talk about is day 10. And by day 10 or the second week, you either get better or you get worse. So day seven to day 10 seems to be a time when we start to see how things are going to go. You either get better or you get worse. So this is the point where you have to be looked, especially if you've got underlying health conditions like my mother, diabetes, hypertension, and so forth. So this is the point that if you find, start to see that you're struggling to breathe or you're not getting better, this is the point where you have to start to think about I need some medical assistance. I was watching my mother and every day I, I came home from work and I was driving home from work every day and I was watching her and asking how she breathing because I, I, I was focused on the fact that we have COVID in our nose and our throat is one thing we can deal with that. And that's what most people get the mild symptoms of that. But where it gets worse is when COVID goes down to your lungs and then you start to struggle to breathe. This is why they advise people to take a saturation, have a sat, what we call an oximeter, Put the oximeter on and you monitor your saturation saturations. If you start to see that your saturations start to fall, you may need help. I didn't have my pulse oximeter. It was in at work. I didn't have my stethoscope. It was at work. I didn't have my blood glucose uh, to check anything. It was at work. So I was going off my mom asking other questions. But one morning I woke up and I went to check on mom. I said, how are you feeling? And she's like, I'm all right. You know, I feel like I'm getting better. But I just started to listen. And I heard that her breathing didn't sound normal. The, the sound wasn't as usual as you would hear. And I said, OK. And I went to work. And it was still playing in my mind. And I called my sister and asked, how's mom doing? And whatever. And I thought to myself, Michael, it's time to call the ambulance. Because she's not getting better. And I knew that day 10 was approaching. So next slide. So get to day 10. What tends to happen is if you're not getting better, you're likely to be coming with COVID pneumonitis. And so it's a form of pneumonia. And sometimes patients can have pneumonia and it can be like unilateral on one side, 
But with COVID pneumonitis, you normally see that it's a bilateral uh, pneumonia and you see consolidation on both lungs. And at this point that you definitely need help. So I sent my mother into, uh, into the hospital and she was literally initially on two liters of oxygen. They put her straight onto dexamethasone, which I'll explain a bit further as we go along next slide. Okay, so here's like a little case. So a 70 year old male admitted to A&E with cough and shortness of breath. His saturations were 89% on air with lymphopenia. That's a, a characteristic of uh, COVID pneumonitis, the lymphopenia. And microbiology tests so positive for SARS-CoV-2. And if you look on the picture on the left, you see that there is a little bit of consolidation or, or, or haziness, as we would say, on, on both sides. But if you look to the right, that showed within two, within that was day one. And then by day three, you see the progression of the consolidation in the lower zones there and in the middle aspects of the lung. That's how quick uh, COVID pneumonitis can progress. So in my mom's case, if we go to the next slide, in my mom's case, she went from two liters here. Again, you can see uh, a little bit of consolidation and then the progression uh, of the consolidation in the lung. So mum went from two liters of oxygen initially, and that was the Monday. And I, she went to a general normal ward that treats COVID patients. And then Thursday, my mother calls me. Bear in mind, I'm dealing with my own patients, dealing with COVID as it is. Uh, she calls me to tell me that, Michael, the oxygen is not working. So I said to her, mum, what do you mean the oxygen is not working? Can you put the nurse on the phone? She put the nurse on the phone. The nurse now told me that my mother is now on 15 liters of oxygen using a venturi mass. So knowing what I know, I know that there's a definitely a progression of, of what's going on. And obviously, and what happens with COVID, next slide, what happens with COVID is there is a, a what we call a hypersensitivity of the immune response. So sometimes you feel like you're getting better and then the immune system develops this hypersensitivity and starts to attack the lungs itself. So there is an increased oxygen requirement. So as you can see, this one at the top in the left is a nasal specs. It's just, you know, what we give standard patients on uh, just, this needs small amounts of oxygen, two liters, six liters and so forth. Then when you start to require more oxygen now, you have to go on to what we call the Venturi mask which gives you 60% oxygen at the highest rate when you're on the green. And then what we tried, to, which is on 15 liters, and then we titrate it down by the colors to try and bring down your oxygen level and wean as tolerable. The next one is a rebreathable mask. And this is trying to give people the, getting the right amount of oxygen to keep the saturations up. This is initial. So this is like when you're on the general words, but then, as my mother, as I saw, she was deteriorating. I got into my car. Many of you saw my, um, my Facebook post begging you all to pray because mom had desatted. I was on the motorway, flying down the motorway, went straight onto the ward, which as Dr. Carol would say, you're not supposed to go into people's hospitals uh, and treat your mother, no. But when it's your own family member, it's a different story. So I went in and I was like, this lady was supposed to be prone from Monday. Why didn't you prone her? They didn't prone her. So by the time I got there, I had told them on the phone, I advised them, prone this lady immediately. They proned her, it brought up her saturations. However, every time she moved, she desatted. So it was, she, I called the registrar and said, this lady needs to get to, on to CPAP immediately. I had asked for a ABG just to see what her oxygen levels were in her blood and she was hypoxic. Can't remember if she was retaining CO2, I think she was. And her lactate was out the roof. So this means now she needs aerosol gen a generating procedure, which we call AIRVO, which is the first one, which delivers a more higher flow of oxygen. And then we have in the middle, which is CPAP. My mom got to this stage. She was on the CPAP machine, which helps you to breathe. So every time you take a breath, it throws oxygen inside and it helps to blow off the CO2 and so forth. Obviously, because my mother could not maintain her saturations, so this machine was maintaining it for her. She had to stay on this, this machine for over four days 
to get her saturations to actually climb. Some people do not tolerate well on the CPAP machine. It's very hard. A lot of my friends have tried it and they've managed 15 seconds. My mom stayed on it for four, uh, for four days, as well as prone in and lying on her front. And some patients just cannot maintain their saturations. I work in a COVID ward where patients are on a CPAP machine. I have them on nearly 100% oxygen and they're still not maintaining their saturations. And so then we have to alternate them and switch them onto the next picture, which you see the third one, which is a man, what we call a hood. And this helps give you a bit more oxygen and titrate it better. It's very claustrophobic and it has a thing called a peep on there, which just helps to give that extra, uh, it's hard to understand, but basically this is, you'd go from the Airvo, which is on the left to the CPAP and to the hood. And if you're still not tolerating your oxygen, you still not managed to keep your saturations up, this is where you end up, ITU. And as you can see, most of these patients here are prone. This is what proning is. A very hard procedure, a very hard thing to do. A lot of patients do not manage it. You ask them, like my mother, I asked her to prone and she struggled until she saw me crying. I'm like, mom, you need to do this. And she, until she saw how imminent and how close she was to death, I can assure you she was close to death. She took this advice and she proned as much as she could. So by proning, it helps your, your lungs to recover better. Um, but all these patients here are on ITU. Some of them are ventilated. Some of them are not actually ventilated at the time. So if you get to this point, it is very detriment. I have a patient at the moment who's been in since November and he is still on the ward. This is why I'm, I'm showing you this, guys, to show you that um, COVID is a real thing. It's not a joke. It's nothing that we play about. It's nothing that we're making up. It's not a conspiracy. This here, what you see on these pictures is what I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Next picture, next slide. Uh, the current treatments that we're using now, dexamethasone, my favorite. So this is a steroid, but those who are diabetic, it sends your, it sends your blood sugars through the roof. <laughs> all my patients are like 25, 26, having to be giving them another rapid all the time. But we have a thing called uh, uh, recovery, recovery trials. So many of them have been trialed on this. And to God be the glory, because of these trials, we are finding that we're not having so much ITU admissions. We're not having so much people on uh, mechanical ventilations. And the, the admissions, the, the duration of the admissions are shorter because of such trials. So in the first wave in March, I found I was going home crying sitting in front of my TV crying because the amount of deaths that I experienced. I remember one time there were, I had eight deaths in one day. Uh, patients, we didn't know much, as I said, about the virus. So it was all new to us. We didn't know about the treatment. But to God be the glory through the year, we have managed to do trials and find some advancement. So dexamethasone is a steroid that we use, which helps uh, to as an anti-inflammatory. Uh, and my mother was on this and she did very well on it. Remdesivir is also a antiviral drug. My mom was on a trial and she was trialed on remdesivir. She came through. Colchizine is a drug given for gout, um, anti-inflammatory for gout. However, recovery, have found, they've taken it off because they found that there's no correlation for recovery. Uh, Tocilizumab is an immunosuppressant drug to treat rheumatoid arthritis found to shorten admissions and reduce the need for mechanical ventilation. Tocilizumab is a very, very, very good drug right now being used on our wards. Uh, Baracitinib is an immunomodulatory drug used for rheumatoid arthritis, also being trialed, and aspirin. Aspirin is a drug that used to thin the blood, and as we know, COVID is a hypercoagulable state. So it tends to cause a lot of thrombosis, especially PEs. When my mother desatted that day, I automatically thought, do a D-dimer. Let's check if she has a PE in her lung because a lot of our patients who have COVID tend to have a lot of PEs and that can be a cause. So aspirin is a good one to keep the blood thin. And obviously with our patients, we have tend to put them on tinsaparin, anoxaparin, or apixaban, those things that keep the bone thinned. Yeah. And the next slide. 
So we won't go through this. This is just showing an algorithm of how they treat patients that's come from ICU or been on a COVID ward and the follow-up that they have to go through. Because obviously some patients experience long COVID. And like I said, I had a man who's been in since November. He's still with us and he requires rehab. He's got to go to a community hospital to have long rehab and so forth. So it's a long process. Those who are fit, some can take, even the very fittest can take three months to get back to baseline, let alone those with comorbidities. I'm giving God thanks that my mom is out of the hospital. She's home and she's back to doing what she normally does. But there are some that to this day are still out of breath, to this day cannot walk as far, still feeling the effects of it and experiencing long COVID. So this is a patient's journey through uh, COVID-19. Let's pray anybody who has it gets the milder version rather than experiencing this. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mike, for sharing with us the patient's journey. Um, we actually also have um, nurse Sandra, who's also gonna share a little bit about the patient's journey from a nurse's perspective. So I'm gonna hand over to you now. Praise the Lord, everyone. Greetings in Jesus' name. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, God bless you. So I'll be doing the patient's journey in terms of when the patient has been um, advised that they need um, a vaccination. So I'll be taking you from the time that you've been offered the vaccination until we give you the vaccination as nurses at the hospitals or wherever, whichever site that you go to. So first of all, you receive a letter or a telephone call. Some receive a telephone call from the GP and some people receive a, um, a letter. Uh, I got a link from the hospital as I worked there. And you'll go online and you'll book your appointment and you'll book the site that you want to go to and the time that you'll be going to it. And then upon attending the, the venue, you will meet up with the administrative uh, staff who will have a discussion with you. They will check your NHS number and your full postal address um, they'll ask your date of birth just to make sure that you are the right person and you are going to uh, be getting the right vaccination. You will then be sent to the nurse or a doctor because doctors are given the vaccination at the GP surgeries. And there are some other venues that doctors and other healthcare professionals are given the vaccine. And then you'll be sent in to see the nurse and where, where I work um, at a few different venues now. I um, have an admin staff that will take a lot of the information when you come to see me. So when you come in, you'll be checked, your date of birth will be checked again, your NHS number and your uh, date of birth and your full name, just to make sure that you are the right person. We have to keep doing that. And then we will ask you several questions before we even think about giving you the vaccination. So we will say to you, have you had the flu vaccination within the last seven days? And if you have had it, say, a couple of days ago, we will wait for seven days before we give you the COVID vaccination. We will ask you, have you had the COVID uh, infection within the last 10 days? As you will be recuperating, we don't want to overload your immune system by giving you another vaccination on top of you feeling unwell. We will also ask you, are you well today? Do you feel well? Do you feel as if you've got a temperature? And if you don't feel well, we will postpone the vaccination until you are well. We then will ask you if you have had any allergic reactions to any medication, and we will say um, any type of allergic reaction, any anaphylaxis reaction, did you become unwell when you had <clears throat> this vaccination? <clears throat> did you have any face swelling, difficulty with breathing? Were you admitted into hospital? Did you become unwell that you fainted or collapsed? And are you um, bringing an epi uh, have you got an EpiPen with you? Are you taking that around? Because that would mean that you, you have had an anaphylaxis reaction to a medication. And we just need to discuss that with the doctor before giving you the vaccination. We'll also ask you if you're pregnant because the vaccination hasn't been tested on pregnant women. So we wouldn't want to uh, give you that at the moment until there's further research will then tell you that you're either going to have the Pfizer COVID vaccination or the AstraZeneca. 
and then we will ask you again, do you consent to have it? I will then ask you, just let you know the side effects of having the vaccination. So I will say that you may experience a headache after having the vaccination. You can feel extreme fatigue. You may have a sore arm and you may generally feel unwell, like flu-like symptoms. And if your temperature lasts for more than a few days, we do ask you to dial 111 or have a discussion with your GP or a healthcare professional because the vaccine should only affect you for uh, 48 hours and no more than that. And then if you're very worried and your temperature is persisting after you've had the vaccine for a, quite a few days, you may need to have a PCR COVID test, the one that goes up your nose and your throat. And that's just, uh, it's not the vaccine that would have given you that, but you may have been incubating COVID before you even came to see us. And so we just make sure that you are happy to have that test. After we've told you all the side effects, then we say again, are you happy to have the vaccination? And if you say that you are happy to have it, then we uh, ask you that once you've had the vaccination, that um, you will need to take a seat in the waiting room for 15 minutes after you've had it. Um, and if you say, well, no, I've got to rush off, we do have a discussion and say, we do need you to wait for 15 minutes before you go off and have it. We ask you, um, which is your uh, dominant arm. So if your dominant arm is your right arm, we do advise that you have it in your left. And that's just simply because you may have a very achy arm after you've had it. Although when I had it, I asked them if I could have it in my dominant arm because I sleep on my left arm. So I just preferred to have it that way. And I was quite happy, happy to have it. Uh, I did have all the side effects and it lasted for two whole days and I was quite unwell but I would have preferred to have had uh, the side effects for two days than go through what uh, Dr. Michael has just, and Dr. Carol has just told us about. Uh, once we've given it to you, we give you uh, a leaflet. We give you a nice little sticker to um, put on your badge if you work in the NHS or put on, on your t-shirt or whatever. And it's just to say, I've had the COVID vaccination and people love to have that sticker. I love that sticker and I wear it on my badge. <laughs> um, and then we give you, um, we just have a little chat with you and say, you just need to wait in the waiting room. And if you feel unwell, please let us know. And people are watching you all the time just to make sure that you are well. And we give you a card to say that you've had it, the date that you've had it, and when you should come back to have your second one. And that's the patient's journey from start to finish from having the vaccination. Thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, doctors Carol and Mike and nurse um, Sandra for those informative presentations. And now we're going to get over, go over to the, the all important questions we asked everybody to, to send in some questions and we received quite a lot of questions that I'm sure will, will make for a very wide ranging conversation from a variety of perspectives. Um, so Melissa Morrison is going to put the questions forward that we have received and I will also be jumping in on the discussion to make sure that we're providing balance. I will be challenging our panelists so that, that, that there is balance in the conversation Everything that I would say um, won't be a statement. I will, I will use questions. I'll make sure what, what I say is framed as a question so that, you know, I, I'm challenging you and so that you can provide another perspective. So over to you, Mel. Brilliant. God bless you, everyone. So the first question we have, and we've got a lot, reads like this. Today we are hearing that European doctors and nurses are refusing to take AstraZeneca's vaccine because the French president has said it has no effect on over 65s. Can someone discuss this, please? So I'll take that one. So the, 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 the French president, as you said, had made a statement that there wasn't enough evidence that the AstraZeneca vaccine was effective on over 65s. In the trials, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the number of older people were, but even though the, the evidence was not adequate, it wasn't absent. And we know that the, the, the efficacy was deemed to be about 70% in total. We have since had trials done on live 
people live, you know, people who've had the vaccines. And recently, uh, Scotland, Public Health Scotland did um, brought out some information for people that they have been following up. And it has shown that the AstraZeneca vaccine and the, the uh, Pfizer vaccine, they've, they've both been very, very effective in real life people who've had the vaccines. So as a result of this, um, the, the French president has, has actually made a U-turn in, in this decision. They have decided that it is now okay for the AstraZeneca vaccine to be given to older people. Some other countries, including Belgium and I think France, Poland, had also followed suit. But they are, especially in Belgium, they had a situation where they were stockpiling the vaccines, people weren't having it. And as a result, the hospital, the hospital admission rate went up to about, four, by about 44%. And if there are more people in hospital, it means that people died. So essentially, it seems people actually lost their lives because of this decision. My uh, take is that even though there wasn't enough, they felt that there wasn't enough information because of the time factor. Like I said, there were 70,000 individuals. I'm not sure exactly what percentage were older people, but there was enough, I think, to at least show that, well, there was enough in evidence to show that individuals, even if not totally protected from the infection, ended up with a less severe form of the illness and didn't end up in hospital. So even if it didn't totally protect them, it's most likely would have afforded them some amount of protection. And we, can, we have seen from the recent trials from Scotland that that is indeed the case. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so following on from that, Dr. Carroll, Others say RNA vaccines are not traditional vaccines and no one knows the side effects. Could you give us some more information about that, please? OK, so like I mentioned in my presentation, traditionally vaccines are made from what we call live attenuated uh, vac uh, vir particles, pathogens or weak or killed particles. So we would use, for example, the, the, the virus. We would either, the virus would either be killed or weakened and put in a form and then made into the vaccine, or you would take parts of the virus to make the vaccine. However, the way we're now, the, the way these vaccines have been made is different because they are genetic vaccines. So what science scientists have done, they have used the genetic information from from the, the virus, which is that RNA, 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 sorry, we have DNA and RNA as genetic information for living things. The virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, uses RNA. That has been synthetically created in the lab and it is packaged in the case of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine in a tiny droplet, which we refer to as a, a, a lipid nanoparticle and is packaged into the vaccine. And that goes into our arm. So it then goes into our cell and it tells the, the body to make the protein that looks like the S protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And that is shown to our body and our body makes an immune, creates an immune response. So that if and when we come in contact with the actual SARS-CoV-2 virus, we would have already been one step ahead of the virus because that's the issue. When you're infected, your body sometimes, as in most 80% of cases, can deal with the virus, but it takes a while for our body to generate that immune response. So having had the vaccine, the body would have already generated that immune response, be ready, armed as it were, ready for when you're exposed to that virus and that is what will protect you. So it's a new way of making the vaccines, but we have seen from the studies and from the live researches, like I said, have been done recently in Scotland, 
that they actually were. They have very, very high levels of efficacy, in fact. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. That is very interesting and a lot of food for thought there. So, Dr. Mike, I'm coming for you. So, could you shed some light around this question? So, a number of younger ladies from differing ethnicities are refusing any vaccine in case it, prote in, in case it affects their fertility. Does the vaccine affect male fertility as well? Okay, so I know people are looking at it in the, in, in the light of like thalidomide that was found to cause uh, issues with babies uh, in the long run. Um, and thalidomide was used as a antiemetic for morning sickness for uh, pregnant women and then obviously found to have problems with babies later on. So, um, so people are looking at it from that direction saying, is this going to be the same kind of thing? But it's a totally different thing in the sense of that thalidomide didn't have much research done, it was just used. In regards to COVID, there's a vast amount of research being carried out. I know that as uh, Sister Sandra said that in one part when they ask, they say, are you pregnant? And they don't give it because there's not much data on pregnant women, however, so that's one side, as Sister Renee said, we need to be not biased and one-sided. So I understand there's not much data there uh, um, given on pregnant women. However, Dr. Edward Morris is a president of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. He said that he wanted to reassure women that there was no evidence at all to suggest that COVID-19 vaccine will affect fertility. And there was no data to support it. And there was no biological plausible mechanism uh, by which current vaccines could cause any impact on a woman or a man's fertility. This was also backed up by Professor uh, Lucy Chapel, who is a consultant uh, obstetrician specializing in women who have medical problems during pregnancy. And she also stated that there is no absolute basis for concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, in ba based on the ones that are licensed to be used in the UK in line with fertility. The British uh, Fertility and Association of Reproductive, Reproductive and Clinical Science published guidance that there was also no evidence and no theoretical reason that any of the vaccines could affect fertility in men or women because vaccinations do not stop you from getting pregnant. And they advise that the best way to reduce the risks of COVID during pregnancy is through vaccination. And when looking at uh, the peak wave that we've just uh, encountered, the, the last wave. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so if that person can just put their mic on Jen. mute, please. Jen. Okay, so as I was saying, so looking at um, the peak wave that we've just gone through, the, the most recent peak, um, the current wave, 9% of all intensive care cases were, were, were either pregnant or recently delivered a baby. And so they were in intensive care. Let's, take, uh, let's remember that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state also, as well as COVID. So some of the sickest patients were in the last trimester of pregnancy. And there was also a threefold increase in premature deliveries. So um, for those who are pregnant, it is actually important that they get vaccinated because those who are actually pregnant do tend to suffer a lot in the later stages of pregnancy. And I have come across patients in ITU pregnant and who have actually lost their lives during the COVID pandemic. Because of, uh, because of pregnancy and COVID-19. So um, I, the advice there is for that, that uh, pregnant women to actually get vaccinated. May I just add something? Sure. So there was, there was something that came out, again, circulated on WhatsApp about the vaccine having the potential to attack the placenta and mm -hmm, hence right. would affect fertility. And so a lot of people were concerned about that. 
this was a statement that was put out by somebody who used to work for Pfizer, somebody called Michael Heaney or something. And mm -hmm. what it is, they thought that the, the S protein, which is the spike protein on the surface of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, is similar to a protein in the placenta Placenta's. that is called syncytial, syncytial mm. one. So it was felt that the body might confuse that placenta protein if you've had the vaccine and attack the placenta. But they have done trials and that has not shown to be the case. So as far as evidence goes, there, that, there is no basis for that and their <laughs> trials have not shown. They've actually looked at placenta for women who've been pregnant and and I think, and women who've had the, the vaccine as well, and nothing has been shown. Sorry, not women. I, I'm not sure, I can't remember for women who've had the vaccine in the trial, but they have examined placenta for, preg for people who've been exposed to the virus at least. And it's not shown to have affected the placenta. Okay. There is no abnormality. So that was actually not proven. Brilliant. Anything else for that question, or are we happy to move on? I think it is worth noting that people did get pregnant during the trials. So they that did. showed. So even though when they're registered for the trials, the vaccine trials, they were asked if they were pregnant and they were discouraged. I mean, advised not to get pregnant, but this is life. People got pregnant. There were about 57 pregnant people in the, among the 70,000 in the three trials. And their outcomes were not Normal. any different from somebody who didn't have the vaccine. So I, I think it was actually in those trials that they did the placenta check and that didn't show that the placentas were, were affected. So you can get pregnant having had the vaccine is what that shows. It shows also that people took their pregnancy to term, the babies were fine, mothers were okay. However, as Dr. Mike said, if you do get COVID-19 towards the end of your pregnancy, there is a chance that you might end up in ITU or that you might end up with a premature baby. So the mm -hmm. advice is generally, we haven't tested this vaccine on pregnant women, but it doesn't mean you can't have it. You can have a discussion with your health uh, practitioner, your GP, for example, if you're pregnant, and especially if you're pregnant and you're at high risk, either because of the work you do or because of the comorbidities you have, if you're diabetic, for example, hypertensive, it's worth having that discussion because you could theoretically have it because there's no real reason why you can't have it. It's just because it's not been tested on pregnant women, but there are actually test trials that are going ahead to look at the effect of the vaccine on pregnancy. To add to that, Sister, uh, uh, Sister Carol, is the fact that what you just said, those who are actually going through gestational diabetes or have preeclampsia or have had preeclampsia in the past or had complications during pregnancy, I think those definitely, you definitely should be at the forefront of vaccination if you've had complications in previous pregnancies. Thank you very much. And there is, I think there is Professor... Elder Professor Paul Brown seems to be on the line and he's, he's made a comment. I don't know if somebody can read it, which is he's saying that it seems people, the unborn babies are actually more protective. Vaccination yeah. with COVID-19 vaccines has been shown to protect the unborn better than natural infection based on the amount of neutralizing antibodies that cross the placenta. Thank uh -huh. you very much. Thank Dr. you. Brown. Thank you. So can I just jump in, um, just so we can make a distinction? Sure. We spoke about fertility and getting pregnant and the fact that the COVID-19 vaccine shouldn't, shouldn't, according to the data, affect that. But is it different for those who are already pregnant? Is there a, is, does the risk increase? Sorry, Sister Rene, I didn't get the question. Would you be kind of... So we, we spoke about fertility and getting pregnant and how the COVID-19 vaccine could affect that or not affect that. What about women who are already pregnant? Do they become a high risk? If they get the vaccine. Yes. If they have the vaccine. Yes. No, it is, if, it, if anything, it protects them. Okay. 
from what we can see from the, the, the studies and as it seems that their babies are likely to do better. Yes, okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. So question four, how is it possible that every other issue, for example, MMR, TB, etc., only has one vaccine around the world, but COVID has half a dozen in counting Sister Sandra, I thought you could answer that for us. So uh, the MMR does have actually different vaccinations. It's got um, the measles, uh, which was created or came about in 1964. It's got the mumps, which was um, made in 1967, rubella 1968. So they were all sort of all on their own. Um, then they put the MMR together uh, quite a while ago. Then we've got the MMRV, which is in America, which is uh, the MMR plus the, um, the chickenpox vaccination as well. Uh, we've got two types of TB vaccinations. So it's not that um, the other vaccines just have one. Um, other vaccines also um, are made by lots of different uh, manufacturers so you may have different names for example I've given the hepatitis b vaccination to nurses and doctors um, one's called Endrix, one's called hep b vax pro so it's not that um the they you know they all give this the same protection if it's uh, mmr or mmrv it's protecting you against chicken box measles mumps and rubella and if it's MMR, it's protecting you against MMR, measles, mumps, and rubella. And then if it's um, TB, it's protecting you against TB. What we're looking at with the Pfizer, Moderna, and the AstraZeneca so far, as someone was saying, there's quite a few of them, is that it's, it's what is in the vaccine and what it's protecting you from. So basically, it's protecting you from preventing you from getting covid um, the COVID infection, and that is the outcome that we're really looking at, is that they all have the, the same outcome, and the outcome is to protect you from uh, becoming unwell with the virus. It's not really about um, who manufactured it and how they manufactured it, but it basically is about protect protection. And I know Sister Carol has some more to, to give us on this subject as well. Thank you, Sister Sandra. Um, Nurse Elaine, who is also on the forum, sent me a really nice picture of the timeline of vaccines and vaccines, you know, we started, they started developing those from the 1700s. And like you rightly said, Sister Sandra, some vaccines have more than one form. For example, the polio, there is an oral form and there is an injectable form. Mm -hmm. But these vaccines, most of them weren't developed in, during a pandemic. The reason why we have so many vaccines for the COVID-19 is because we, were, we, we are still in a pandemic. And if you're in a pandemic, it's an emergency. And like I said, government were col collaborating with each other and with large companies and non-governmental companies. So a lot of investment has been made. And you don't want to put your eggs in one basket. We're in a pandemic, we need a result, we need a vaccine, let's get on and do it. And that's exactly what happened. And of course, there is this element of national pride as well. How would you feel if Britain didn't have a vaccine? You'd probably be thinking what they've been doing. So every country wanted to be there, every scientist wanted, to, and so they got on and they did it. And I think it is a blessing that we have so many vaccines because they've been through the trials, like I said, and the efficacy that are being reported are very high. So they've done very well. And also different vaccine, even though the end point is the same, where we want our bodies to build an immunity to the, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, so that when and if we're exposed to it, we can fight it. There is it's the, 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 the difference, there are differences obviously, as I mentioned, between the storage, for example. AstraZeneca is different from from Pfizer-BioNTech. And that's because of the way it's made. The Pfizer-BioNTech, like I explained, used this lipid fat droplet to transport the mRNA into the vaccine so it gets into the body. That requires it to be stored at a very, very, very low temperature. Whereas the AstraZeneca uses a different means of transporting the, the, 
the DNA matter into your bodies. So it doesn't have to be stored at that low temperature. Now there are implications for poorer countries, you know, so they'll be able to use the AstraZeneca vaccine more <laughs> readily because they don't have to worry about the logistics of storing the vaccine at the lower temperature. So it's good that we've got so many. Uh, it just means that there will be more, there are more choices and it can hopefully reach as many people as possible in the world because no one is safe until everybody is safe. Yeah. Next question. Since individuals have been taking the vaccine, is there any record of how people have died or have had severe reaction to the vaccine? If so, why is there no information about it? Dr. Mike, could you answer that one, please? Okay, I know conscious of time i'll try and be quick with my question and move my answers i heard you renee don't worry i heard you okay so um but basically uh the bmj with the british medical journal uh posted an article that said that norway are actually investigating 23 deaths actually in some frail elderly patients after taking the vaccine um but actually the medical director in the norwegian medical agency he was saying that he doesn't think there's a coincidence uh, around it. And he's not certain if there's a connection between the deaths and the vaccine. And what we've got to understand is that elderly people are elderly. And obviously taking the vaccine could aggravate some of the underlying issues that elderly people face. So look, put it into perspective, more than let's say 20,000 doses of the vaccine are administered in one week, yep. In that same week, on a normal week, let's take out the fact that we're going through a pandemic, around 400 deaths normally occur in the residential home in one week. So 23 deaths, and when we're taking 400 uh, deaths a week in a normal residential home is not really that much. Um, Paul and Rich Institute in Germany is also investigating the fact that 10, there were 10 deaths in Germany shortly after COVID vaccination. But same again, it's the same thing. These were mainly elderly people. Uh, as of January the 19th, uh, 71 people have been observed in Europe uh, linked to Pfizer vaccine across Europe, 16 in the UK, 12 in Germany, 23 in Norway, and some elsewhere. But the French agency argued that there is no correlation between the vaccine and deaths. So let's look at it. 35% of people who died in general, after taking the vaccination in a certain period of time, were over 90 years old. That could have been due to anything. 46% were over 80, and almost all 98% were over 70. So that's, you know, they're old people. Not saying that old people have to die, but, you know, there are other comorbidities that can affect that somebody could die of, and it not have to be the vaccine. When putting Pfizer and AstraZeneca together, they were evaluated in clinical trials, uh, Pfizer was, uh, had a clinical trial of over 44,000 participants and AstraZeneca uh, were over 23,000 participants. And they were, with that AstraZeneca and Pfizer, they were looking at the, the main adverse drug rea or adverse reactions that they experienced. Most of them were just like injection site pain, fever, myalgia, um, some had, uh, some had, you know, arthralgia, which is like joint pain and so forth. So it was the main mild uh, symptoms that you feel when having the flu. Uh, during my, in my hospital of vaccinations, I work next to a and &E. I've never heard that a patient has come back in, you know, on a crash call because she just had the vaccine and she is crashed. Nothing like that's happened. Patients, however, I have to be honest and both sided, Patients uh, or, or staff have gone home with a fever or feeling sick or tired, but they've never had anything more than that. And that will only last for about two days. Never really lasts. It's never ongoing. And we, people are advised if you, have, if you have a history of anaphylaxis to certain vaccines, then maybe you're advised maybe to take, if you take it, take it with precaution, take it at a hospital or make sure. And you're also advised actually, that you must stay within the area for 15 minutes. So if an anaphylactic response was to happen, anaphylaxis we know is type one, it's not delayed, it's an immediate reaction. It should happen within a certain period of time. 
So they are in a safe environment should that happen. But to date, I haven't seen that happen in anybody who's been vaccinated. Can I just jump in so we can get a little bit more clarification? Um, sure. So this question's asking if, if there is a record of how many people who have died or had a severe reaction, and if so, is that information accessible to the wider public? It is. Uh, the internet is out there. It's open. You can access it. That's the same way I went onto a journal and accessed it. Obviously, it's not sitting on the news and saying, you know, so they, I know the news is showing such and such and such amount of people have been vaccinated. It doesn't show such and such amount of people had an anaphylactic shock. It doesn't show that. Yeah. yeah. But from what I've studied and looked, I've only seen about the deaths in Norway and the 16 deaths in the UK that have not actually been attributed to the vaccine, but I've just died within a certain time period of them having a vaccine. But there's not been any correlation, you know, as Sister Carol, you may know, in a hospital, every patient is has to have, if they die within the hospital, has to go through medical examination. Nobody, nothing has come back from my end that a patient has died as opposed to a vaccination. I haven't heard it. So I haven't seen a strong evidence for that. Sister Carol, have you? Yes. So no, the, the, the information is available. And we have, as individuals, as doctors, and as the general public, anybody can report an adverse reaction mm -hmm. to in England, we have something called the yellow card scheme. So anybody who has an adverse reaction can report it. And that is accessible on the internet in America. They've got a similar scheme. I can't remember what it's called, but everybody who's had the vaccine and who has a reaction that they deem to be adverse can report it. And all of this is investigated. Reporting it doesn't mean that it is because of the vaccine. But if you have a suspicion that it might be because of the vaccine, it is reported. And this scheme, the yellow card scheme, you can look at it. That's there. So That is where I got the information from about the 44,000 participants. So it's, it's documented. Where the, and the, yeah, where the yellow card is it. from. Yes, right. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. So the next question... Um, if you could also discuss vitamin D and COVID-19. Is there any research on this subject specifically involving black people? Okay, vitamin D. Ah, I like this one. I had three patients today, this week with vitamin D intoxicity <laughs> because they're taking vitamin D spray and tablets to prevent them from getting COVID. And then obviously they came in with vitamin D intoxicity. So we obviously know the major role of vitamin D is to maintain the normal blood levels of calcium and phosphate. Uh, but however, vitamin D has also been found to help trigger the body's immune cell to produce antibodies. And I think that's been put on the internet. So everybody's out to buy vitamin D. But also we've seen that there is a correlation with vitamin D deficiency in black people. And that's mainly due to the pigmentation that we have, what we know as melanin. And so we tend to not absorb as much vitamin D, as well as the fact that we don't live in an area with so much sunlight. So it can affect our absorption of vitamin D. So the National Library of Medicine published an article about uh, vitamin D insufficiency, which was more, found to be more prevalent among the black people than the white counterparts and that black people did not really achieve optimum vitamin D levels at any time of the year. And that was due to obviously due to the pigmentation of melanin. Um, however, there was also an article on the BMJ, as I keep going to the BMJ, uh, British Medical Journal that showed that vitamin D deficiency and death rates were very high amongst, or they were both disproportionately higher in elderly Italians, Spanish, Somalians, and African Americans. And because of this, the Lancet released an article by NICE in co collaboration with the Public Health England that they actually decided to try and get those who are more vulnerable and more elderly to increase their vitamin D uptake in their winter months and autumn months because it would help with bone. Uh, you know, bone and muscle health during the winter during the winter periods. However, on the other side, there is no sufficient evidence that has been shown that vitamin D supplementation is a treatment or a prevention for COVID. 
but I can say this, a few of my patients that died this week, I had one patient in his 60s, fit as ever, went to the gym how many times a week, came in, he was in, he needed CPAP, he was on CPAP, within four hours he was needed ITU, and within three hours he was dead. And he was found to have low vitamin D um, in the bloods. His vitamin D was low. So our normal levels of vitamin D should be above 30 nanograms per milliliter. So as I said, there is no sufficient evidence in regards to vitamin D being a mechanism for treatment and prevention. However, we are found as black people to have lower vitamin D levels. Can I just add quickly that there are lots of observational studies that have been done, even though you, there, you, you're saying that there isn't enough evidence. There are lots of observational studies. The thing with mm -hmm. observational studies is that you can't say it is the cause. You That's can only say it is a correlation. So until we've done more like randomized control studies, in fact, there has been one um, systemic uh, systematic review that has been done, but there are, there is a dearth of evidence out there to link low levels of vitamin D with a worse outcome of COVID-19. Other things that are implicated is a high body mass index. So if you're overweight, because vitamin D is a fat soluble vitamin, if you've got lots of fat, it will stay in the fat and not get in the blood. So that is also shown to link with it. And of course, if you've got darker skin, you are more likely to have a lower level, so you're more likely to do worse if you get COVID. And if you're older, because your skin doesn't absorb the sunlight to make the vitamin D as if, as if you were younger. So though there aren't uh, evidence, robust evidence from randomized control studies enough, there are lots of observational studies linking people outside of hospital or in hospital and when people were admitted to hospital in Spain and they were given the active form of vitamin D, they did very well. Yeah, so there is, there, is, there is enough link to show that well, there is some we don't kind want of you to We don't want you to go intoxicate yourself with vitamin D now. Take it easy. You know, make sure you can actually go to your GP and get your vitamin D tested. You can do blood tests to get your vitamin D tested to see if you're deficient and go about it that way and get that sorted. But like I said, I have two patients who are in for hypercalcemia and vitamin D intoxication because of that. So be careful. So the national, there is a national guidance. Um, Dr. Mike just mentioned it, call it NIC. We call it NICE. Um, it basically is a national guideline for England for medications and treatments. They've put out, there's a statement on there. And again, this is accessible to members of the public. It's recommended that during the winter months, everybody, regardless of your color, whatever, take a, a level of vitamin D. It's only 400 international units, which is um, quite low, to be honest, 10 micrograms. But that's what the government recommends. But they do say that if you have insufficient levels, you can increase. And up to 4,000 international units is said to be safe or nice. If you do not have underlying problems like kidney problems uh, and other problems that are associated with toxicity, the best thing to do, as Dr. Mike said, would to get your levels checked. But I'm telling you, that's hard to do. So <laughs> it's hard to get your levels checked. But it is believed that most people with dark skin, if you're not deficient, you're at least in this country, in England, where we live so far from the equator, um, I've got insufficient levels. Most and if, if, if you take just the tiny bit that the government recommends, at least it is something. But remember, up to a level is recommended. You can check it on NICE. Brilliant. So we can check all that information on NICE. So the next topic, um, some participants just wanted a bit more clarity about. So the use of fetal tissue in the vaccines, Dr. Carol, could you just discuss this quickly, please? Okay, so quickly jump in and say with this discussion or question, I think it would be great to not only get a medical but also um, spiritual as well because I'm, one of some of the concerns that I've heard about the fetal tissues is our standpoint as Christians in regards to. I mean, this leads into conversations about you know our stance on abortion, etc. So, if you could provide those two, absolutely, absolutely. 
Yeah. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so as I was explaining how the vaccines are made, it's different. Fetal tissues are not in the actual vaccines, but traditionally, what we refer to as fetal cell lines have been used in the testing and development of some vaccines. And this has been used for many years. Um, COVID-19 has done a lot of good in the sense that it has brought a lot of things which were sort of covert to the fore for us to have a discussion about it. And this is one thing. So the rubella vaccine, I think one type of one type of diphtheria vaccine. Some other vaccines that we've been using for years have all have been used, have been developed using fetal cell lines. So these, there are two main um, abortions that occurred in the 1960s. And scientists have used cells from these aborted fetuses to grow the virus for example, that develop vaccines. So like one of the, some of the COVID-19 vaccines have used the, so when we talk about the fetal cell line, we're not talking about the actual cell that came directly from the fetuses. These have been kept in the lab since the 1960s and they are kept at a low temperature. They refer to them as being genetically modified. So they keep modifying them, using them over and over and over and over. The cells keep growing because that's one of the reasons why it is used. Fetal cells are what we call pluripotent so they can multiply and multiply and multiply and multiply. And that's different from how ordinary human adult cells were. So these cells have been used to grow the virus, for example, the adenovirus that is used to transport the, the uh, DNA for the, for the AstraZeneca vaccine, for example. So it's used in the development, but not in the actual uh, fetal tissue, in the actual vaccine, sorry. In terms, as, as Sister Renee mentioned, this is an emotive subject. It's something, you know, we could have discussions about that for the entire session, really, because people have different views. And of course, as Christians, we are against abortion. We believe, you know, that life starts from even before, you know, the, the cells come together. Um, so there have been a lot of um, discussions. As far as I'm aware, our church doesn't have a, a formal statement on the issue. But the Catholic Church, for example, has put out a statement in 2005 that the Catholic Pontifact um, for life put out a statement and there are other um, Catholic groups that have put out a statement. Essentially what the, the essence of what they've said is that it is morally permissible to accept vaccines when there are no alternatives and there is a serious risk to health. And this particularly um, before COVID-19, this referred more, was more applicable to mothers who knew of the fetal cell line that was used to develop vaccines and needed their children to be vaccinated. So that those statements, you know, particularly applied to them because it was felt that as individuals, you had a moral responsibility, not just to yourself and to your children, but to others in the society. We talk about um, herd immunity and we might not, see that as being a, a big thing. I mean, we can see the effects with COVID-19, but for children, things like rubella and those, these diseases that have now been eradicated because of vaccines doesn't mean a lot to us, but children died because of those diseases. And now we don't see them much. It's only because of vaccine. So it is, it is, it is a gray area, it's an emotive subject, it's a difficult um, line to tread, as it were, but the information is there. And AstraZeneca, for example, haven't hidden it, it's on the, the leaflet, vaccine leaflet, that they use these cell lines to develop the vaccine, even though it's not in the actual vaccine. It add to that, um, one, as you said, it's, I know, as AstraZeneca, 
they've confirmed it, but they've developed it. And it's like you said, they've used the cell lines from the 1960s, 1970s. So it's not actually taken from aborted tissue. And two, we don't know if it's a therapeutic abortion in the sense of therapeutic abortion or abortion that, because the word abortion means to pass out. Some abortions could have been, obviously the mother didn't want a baby or it could have been an abortion that, you know, the body rejected the baby and, the baby, and you know, the body missed and, and came out. We don't know what type of abortion has been used. So we cannot also just jump to speculations that it's automatically somebody who said, I don't want a baby. It could have been a normal abortion where a mother just missed, had a miscarriage, so to speak. That is a form of abortion. So we don't know. The next question, um, Sister Sandra, should I be taking an unknown vaccine for a previously unknown condition? So first of all, what I'd like to say is it's not an unknown condition now. It's been with us for about a year. And um, the vaccine, uh, the first one that was given at the UHB hospital was given um, on the 11th of December. So actually, it's not unknown. And what, what I have to say about that is once we've given you the information, you will then be able to make an informed decision whether you would like to take the vaccine or not. Um, because even though uh, it was unknown quite a while ago, it's not unknown anymore. It's actually known now. Can I just add to that? I'm, I don't want to be rude, and please don't take me rude. I'm just going to be honest. How many of you go to farm foods and read the, the ingredients? And many of us go around and we go to Tesco and we go to how much place and we buy things and we don't know what we're eating, but we suspect and we believe that it is this. And one time we, we heard that we found out that in Tesco, some meat was, 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 was horse meat, all right? So we're saying that, okay, oh, we don't know what's in the vaccine and stuff, but some of the things that we eat on a daily basis, we still don't know what we're eating. But we trust and we believe that the thing that says beef, we're eating beef. So sometimes I believe, and, and what you've got to understand is that we have the FDA and so forth and so many regulator things that this vaccine has to go through that it cannot be a thing that they, 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 what they're selling is what they're selling. Trust me, because we cannot, there's too many regulators and this to go through that it is a, it's a the vaccine, what they're saying, they well are aware of the vaccine that they're giving. It has been tested with so many people. It's not an unknown thing. Mm. And not only that, coronaviruses have been around for many years. It's just that this strain, COVID-19, is a new strain. But coronavirus is not new. Mm. It's not new. I like the example that you've given. but um, and, and one thing to add on to that is that's why as Christians as well, I, mean, I don't want to be overly spiritual, but that's why as Christians as well, it's so important to have discernment. I mean, we're all here answering questions from our specialisms but it's also very important important to have discernment to pray and ask God because everything is unknown until it's known right um, and whether that comes with bad implications or good in implications you'll only know until you've encountered it um, so it's it's also important there to stress having discernment in in, in these things and, and and thinking about these things is is um, essential definitely Okay, uh, question nine. Uh, Dr. Carroll, discuss mutations slash variant strains of the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Sister Mel, just before I answer that question, can I just add something that Prof. Brown has added regarding the fetal cell lines? He's added that the main purpose of the original use of fetal tissue for vaccine development was to avoid the proliferation of animal viruses which was an issue in the early days. Um, these, those viruses contaminated the early vaccines because of the success the platform is still used today. So the fetal tissues were used rather than using animal tissues, my understanding, because they would contaminate the, the vaccine. And I think that's justifiable. That's justifiable. Okay. So in terms of the mutation, are you taking that, Dr. Mike? No, that's you, Dr. Carroll. Okay, so that's fine. Um, so <laughs> mutations, every virus mutate. Viruses are always mutating. 
and SARS-CoV-2 is no different. Um, there are studies that can be done to show that the virus, for example, that is prevalent in England is not necessarily the one that's, it's not the same as the one that's in Jamaica, for example. There might be a little bit of um, difference, but phylogenic um, studies show that there are, and there are slight differences. When the, the mutation is such that it, the virus behaves differently and has impact on how it's managed or how we, or the severity of the disease, then it becomes a variant of concern. And as you know, we've got at the moment, I'm, I'm not, I can't keep up with the numbers, but we certainly know that there was one that was identified in Kent and was referred to as the B117. And then there was one in South Africa and then another one identified in Brazil. I've heard of um, one emerging in Japan and there were talks about Nigeria and recently talks about um, in America, New York and other places. The, the, the importance of these, why they are called um, variant of concern is because they behave differently from the original virus. So like I said, the virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus was isolated and extensively studied. So we know the genome, we know the proteinome. Virus is made up mostly of protein. Protein is made up of lots of amino acids. That's the base, the things that make protein. And I think the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus has over a thousand amino acids. So when one amino acid changes, I am, I am not a molecular biologist, I, I, I'm just telling you the basis, the, 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 the virus may behave differently. The main um, protein that is studied of, for the SARS-CoV-2 is that spike protein, that thing that gives it the characteristic look, that gives it the name corona because it looks like a crown. That's what is studied. And when there's enough mute, and because we use that to develop the vaccine, if there is a change in that part of the virus, then it means that the vaccines might not work. And so that is why mutations are important because, sorry, variants of concerns are important because it has implications as to whether or not the existing vaccine will work. It also has implications as to how well the how, how much it will affect the population. So when the new strain was identified in England, we were told that it is 50% more transmissible. And again, it differs because of how the protein changes in the virus, making it more effective at attaching itself to our human cells and in, infecting us. So, for, so more people will get infected and if more people are infected, it, it means that eventually more people may end up being more unwell and possibly, possibly die. But just to say that it doesn't seem at the moment that the virus has mutated enough to evade the use of the current vaccines. A lot of studying is being done. Certainly Moderna is checking, again, is checking, doing studies to check if the current vaccine will be effective against the, I'm not sure if, if it's all the strains, but at least some of the, the variants that, that are available. So the mutations, the variants are there and they're constantly developing. They have implications for how the pandemic will, play, will fare eventually. But the main thing is what does the, the difference in the, in the the vaccine do? Does it make us make the vaccine, the disease more transmissible or does it make individuals become more unwell? That's why it's important to us, but also do the existing treatment that we have will still work. So far, there is no evidence to say that they aren't working and they will not work, but it is ongoing as to what will eventually happen. What we may find happen is that the existing vaccines may have to be tweaked mm -hmm. to treat variants. And so like the flu vaccine, flu. which mutates a lot, 
that we might have to have a vaccine every year because of the change in the, the virus, but that is yet to be seen. Okay, so, uh, Dr. Carroll, so obviously I have my answer for what I'm gonna say, but I'm gonna be like some of the people in the audience now and ask a question what I hear often. Now I know my answer to it, but I'm gonna throw it to you, is that all right? So why is it that you have flu and we can't get a vaccine or we have HIV and there's no cure for HIV and let's say what people like to use and there's cancer and there's no cure for cancer but within 10 months we have a vaccine for coronavirus. So I'm not too sure what is the what is the question? Are you asking so, why we have a vaccine so, in 10 months? Yes or because why? what we tend to hear a lot is why is it that cancer has been around for so long and we've done so, we've got cancer research and millions of pounds are thrown into cancer research and yet we don't have cures for cancer. Why is it that we have HIV that's been around since the eighties and we have no cure for HIV, which is also a virus and is an is a RNA virus, if I'm correct, it's not DNA. So why is it now we've got coronavirus and it just came from the end of 2019 and now we have a vaccine for this, but we have no vaccine for HIV. Well, for one, like I said, a lot of resources have been thrown at um, developing the, 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 the COVID-19 vaccine because it's an emergency. We're in a pandemic. In the other situations, it's not a pandemic. So we're going through the traditional processes of developing the vaccine. Mm -hmm. The other diseases like um, HIV and cancer, for example, they are more chronic conditions so it's more it was more difficult to develop a vaccine for chronic conditions because the immune system works different in relation to that. But on the other hand, things like flu, for example, we're having to change the vaccines, as I mentioned, because of the constant mutation. So it's a combination of, of combination of things. Mm -hmm. Resources, money the nature of the disease, whether it's an acute infection or a chronic condition and the level of mutation that's occurring. Thank you. Thank you. So we're over halfway with the questions now. Um, so I'm gonna ask that everyone's answers are tighter going forward, um, but all in all, it's a good discussion. So the next question, so Sandra, can the vaccine doses be mixed? So for example, can I have the first one be the Pfizer vaccine? the second dose be the AstraZeneca vaccine? So it's a very short answer, really. The PHE, Public Health England guidelines, have asked us not to mix the vaccines. Uh, so if you have the Pfizer the first time, you must have the Pfizer, Pfizer the second time, and so be it with the AstraZeneca as well. Although there is a study um, by the National Institute for Health Research um, which has started just recently. It's called the Comcov study. It started in February and they're asking for volunteers of over 50 years old to take part in a study that will trial the mixing of vaccines to see if there'll be more flexibility and um, if the vaccines will be more effective if they are mixed. But at the moment, we've been asked not to mix them. Brilliant. Thank you, Sister Sandra. Thank you. Um, question 11. What are the arguments for and against the vaccine? So anyone on the panel can kind of chip in here with maybe one or two reasons for or against. So the for, the, the reason to have a vaccine is that it will stimulate the body's immune system to prepare for the actual virus in the event you're you're exposed to it. So it's like having your ammunition ready. It takes time to develop the immune system. So if you've had the vaccine, when you actually get the vaccine, I'm there, I'm ready, I recognize you. The antibodies come to play and the helper T cells and the killer T cells and the B cells, they all come into play and attack the vaccine. And attack, sorry, the virus, the virus, sorry. Four, my four is the fact that it has been found to reduce hospital admissions. And even if you go into hospital, it is found to reduce ITU admission. And if you even have to go into ITU, it is found to reduce death. I can't beat that one. I'm gonna come in with a bit of balance. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
actually, I'm going to try and give a for and, a, and, an, and an against. Um, a for would be that there is a lot of data, um, statistics and evidence that, th that the vaccine has been helping a lot of people and also minimizing the spread of the coronavirus. So that's a four. And against that, that I, I think a lot of people have uh, vocalized, um, one on a, spiritual, on a spiritual level is, um, and I know this kind of lends into some people thinking, oh, well, that's just a conspiracy theory. But I think when we're dealing with the Bible and, and the spirit realm, these are genuine concerns because a lot of them are lending into ideas about, you know, end times. So one is, is um, I know a lot of people use the scripture revelations, um, chapter 13, verse 17, which talks about how no one will be able to buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the name of the beast or the number of its name. I know we spoke earlier about, um, you know, oh, do we need the, to be vaccinated to go and do certain things, to fly to different countries, to uh, buy or sell? This is something that we've, but, but one of the facts is that in certain countries, you can't do those things if I'm, if I'm right. We had this discussion before. Um, in the UK, it, it's, it's that you, you can still go and do these things if you're not vaccinated. But this is a genuine concern. I think when we're, when we're having discussions about end times and we're having discussions about um, different spiritual agendas, all questions here are valid. So there's, there's no question that's silly or stupid or invalid. They're all valid questions because we're all concerned predominantly, not about our physical health, but, but our spiritual health and, and, and you know, where, where we're going to end up. Um, so that has been one side for and against. Another, as I mentioned before, was about um, the, the fetal cell lines, which has been cleared up by Dr. Carroll. Thank you. Um, another one is that, as you've mentioned, um, this has come out quite quickly and although it has been around and we do know about it now it has come out quite quickly um and in regards to cancer i think somebody mentioned cancer earlier there was a time where cancer if i could describe it as such was a global pandemic you know with all of this, the same level of seriousness i think there is a lot of fear now with this um specifically because of of the numbers of people dying in the rapid rate which is understandable um, so there is another another against it's not an against um, as in don't take the vaccine. It's, it's more why people aren't some people aren't taking the vaccine. And that's on a racial level. Um, as I mentioned at the start, the thing that we have to consider is that a lot the black community does have a distrust, unfortunately, with healthcare and the NHS because of a long history of medical racism. And that's so so in that turn. The question shouldn't be, why aren't the black community not being vaccinated? The question should be from medical professionals, how do we regain their trust so that they can, if, you know, if they want to or, or they need to take this vaccine? So there's, there's so many um, questions and angles that need to be considered when having this. And that's why it's so important to hear the facts, the wonderful facts that we've been hearing from our medical professionals so that you can make an informed decision. But when making an informed decision, do line up the for and against and make sure it's not just a medical for and against or a physical. Make sure it's also spiritual and all of the other things that you care about. Definitely, I 100% agree with that. Um, and that's why I guess we're doing this so that people can get the trust. And we're trying to build back your trust. As I'm a, health, I'm a medical professional. So is Dr. Carol here. So is Sister Sandra. I took my vaccine. And the thing is, for me, when I, I was working at Warsaw Hospital and they were just running around, oh, do anybody want the vaccine? Because we've got how many spare? And I ran to it and I did mine. And the first thing I did when I got my vaccine was call my mother. and be like, mom, I have my vaccine. You need to get yours. And my, I didn't like the fact that I was vaccinated. And my mom was like, well done, son. Well done. You did well. Well done. And I'm like, okay, but you need to get vaccinated now. And she's still talking about Bill Gates. And... Trust me, when I look, I'm going to be 100 with you guys. When my mum was in that hospital bed and I came in and I ran in that hospital and I saw her there prone and I rubbed her back and I said, mum, you're going to be okay. And she kept saying to me, are you sure? Are you sure? And she even told me she dreamt while she was there in that hospital bed that I dug a 12 foot grave for her. And she was asking me, Michael, why have you put me down so deep? Why have you put me down so deep? 
And I remember walking, when I took her from that ward to the next ward where she needed more oxygen, I rubbed her back again and said, mum, it's going to be good. And she cried. My mum was crying out of fear. Now, this is a woman that didn't take the vaccine. And I'm, I'm, not, tell, I'm not here to tell you guys to take the vaccine. I'm not. But if you ever, I, I don't wish I'm even my worst enemy, to experience that week that I went through. Those on my choir know what I went through. I didn't eat from Monday until the Sunday. Couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. Just sat at the phone trying to call the ward to find out what's going on. Because for you guys, if one of your family, God forbid, was to ever get taken into hospital, I had the advantage of being to know the hospital that she was in, that I could use my old card and swipe and go in there. But for the, the general public, your family member goes into hospital, you don't see them. You're calling the phone, but they're so busy, you don't get an update. You just want to know how your family member's doing. You don't hear anything. I was scared, sat on the edge of my bed every day, couldn't sleep, couldn't talk, whatever. It is a scary time, guys. It, and, and then I know for a fact, if my mom would, uh, ex knew what she had gone through, if she knew what about it before what she went through, she would have gone for the vaccine 100%. Now, I told her, 30 days later after you've come out of this hospital, you're going for your vaccine? She was like, yes, yes, yes. You understand? Because now she's been through it. And he that feels it knows it. And I speak, I used to speak from a doctor's perspective about COVID. Now I speak from someone who's been so close to it and experienced it. I knew, I know about COVID because like I said, I work in it. But I found myself texting my friend who lost his mother a week before my mom went in. He lost his mother to COVID, who was 10 years younger than my mom. Went in on CPAP like my mom is. And I was like, what happened after four days when your mom was on CPAP? And he's like, yeah, she deteriorated and when she went to I2 and she died. And I was doing this and, and playing this in my head because how bad it is, guys. Trust me. This is not about race anymore because black are dying. What? The Filipinos that die or the staff have died. The Indians that have died, this is not, no longer about race. And to go for, guys, I'll tell you the truth, yeah. I used to hear people talk about mental health and say, oh, people's mental health with this COVID thing. And I said, oh, people need to stop talking about mental health. We love to use mental health too much. It is a real thing. And I've noticed that going to work, going home to my room, then going to work, dealing with COVID, going home, and not being able to have a social life, not being able to come together in church, it is taxing. It really is taxing on your mental health. The only way forward in here is vaccination. The only way we're going to get through this pandemic with God, amen, but the way forward is through vaccination. And when we get vaccinated, we can move on with life. And I, honestly, if this is a thing, that, remember, say COVID, if we don't get vaccinated, COVID is going to be around for a long time. And it may be around every year and we might have to revaccinate. I do not want my mother to have to experience that same feeling again. Because flu is a thing that we can get all the time. You know, we get one strain and we get another strain. We get we could get flu today and then next year, this time again, we get flu again. I don't want January to come next year and my mother's hit with COVID again. So the way forward is vaccination. Believe me, and I'll, I'll move on to the next question, but believe me, guys, yeah, that to date was the worst week of my life. And I'm not exaggerating. The worst ever week. When your family member is lying in that bed and you don't know because COVID, one minute you're up and the next minute you're down. When it's your family member, trust me, you would have wished you took the vaccine. That's, that, I have nothing more to say on that. I think, can I just quickly, because I, I love that you shared a real story um, such as that. I think that puts a lot of things into to context. Um, and it also that example shows, or is a demonstration of why making this decision should be a personal one. Everybody's Definitely. had um, certain individual personal experiences which have led them to either think, no, I'm not going to take this thing or I am going to take this thing. And either which way you have to do, you know, aligned with your faith and what you believe and, and your own experience, you know, which has shaped that thinking. Um, so, so and, and this is also why we are not pressuring um, anyone to take the vaccine or to not take the vaccine simply because I don't know what you've been through your experience with this you don't know what I've been through in my experience with this um, and, and so it has to be a personal decision I know a lot of people are fit some pe people may uh, be feeling peer pressure to take it some people may be 
feel peer pressure to not take it or have already taken it and feel like there shouldn't be shame either way from the church or, or from, you know, your local community. There shouldn't be shame either way. This decision is yours first and foremost. 100%, 100%. I, like I said, we only can give you our experiences and the facts, but the, the ultimate decision is yours. Whether you take it or whether you don't is not up to me but I only can give you the facts of it. Thank you for sharing that, Mike. I wonder if you can just continue um, and talk about how the death rate for COVID is calculated and whether or not we can actually trust the data that's out there. <laughs> okay. So how the death rate is calculated in COVID is defined basically for surveillance purposes as death resulting from clinically compatible illnesses in a probable or confirmed COVID cases, yeah. So unless there's a, a clear alternative cause of death, such as like you got murdered or, you know, a trauma case, car accident, then that's not the case. But how we do it, we basically calculate it as uh, COVID, a death that has happened within 28 days of testing positive. That's how it's calculated. Why it's calculated like that is because people don't just always just, die straight away from COVID like that. Some people actually are on ITU for a couple of days or it, it goes on for a few weeks before death actually occurs. So they've given it a space of a month, around a month's time for those cases there. So it's any death that has happened within 28 days of testing positive. However, I stress the point that it doesn't always mean that the person has died of COVID. A person could have a heart attack, but COVID will still be written on their death certificate, whether it be the primary source or secondary or contributing factor to death, it will be written on there. So there are different ways they calculate as well. Some uh, calculate death rates in base of calculating the excess death rate. So they compare the total number of deaths in a week to the average expected from previous years and then see how the death rates are compared from that way. So looking at uh, Public Health England, how some of the ways they've done it, uh, they've reviewed epidemiological, epidemiological evidence of how likely it was that COVID was a contributing factor at different points, uh, at death at different points in time after a positive test. So they looked at 41,598 deaths confirmed COVID positive patient who had died and they examined it up to August 2020. And of these, 88% of deaths occurred within 28 days of a positive test. And there was 96% of deaths that occurred within 60 days had COVID-19 on their death certificate. So overall, 91% of deaths uh, reported by Public Health England with confirmed cases were actually on their death certificate. So if you die within 60 days, you most likely had COVID-19 on your death certificate. But like I said, we see on the news the big death rate, the big death rate, but that is actually those who died within 28 days of testing positive with COVID-19. So it's not always that COVID was the main reason why they died. So if I have a, say for instance, I have a patient on my ward, she's now tested positive. And she may never had no, uh, she may never had no real uh, respiratory symptoms, but she had an acute kidney injury and she went downhill. She just went downhill and then she got another infection and she went downhill. The fact that she tested positive, she will be counted amongst those that have died of COVID, even though the real reason why she died was not actually COVID. So just in put that sense, into perspective. In in that sense, Doctor Mike, you're saying that it could be that you died from COVID or with COVID. Yes. So that is what's counted. You are you're, once you've died within 28 days, you either died of or oh. with, but both are still collaborated together as COVID cases. Okay. I think that it's, it's, it's also worth noting that the reason why this question came up is because some people feel that they, the numbers are inflated. And no, they're not. There's a content. Yeah. So one of the ways to check whether this is the case is to look at something that we call the excess death rate. And it's basically comparing like this time last year, last year. The, the death rate, what was it now and what it was last year and decide. So why is it, is it excessive? And if it is, 
what is the most likely reason. And when that has been done, it's been shown that the excess death rate is significantly higher. And the only plausible reason, even without anything else, is because of COVID. And it is, it is, it is important to note that even though people might not die from COVID or with COVID, people die because of COVID. So I was having a discussion recently with one of the professors from British Heart Foundation, because I'm really interested in what happened with heart attacks. And it was found that the heart number of people who were attending hospital with heart attacks was actually down by 50%. And you would think in a situation like this, why? How can that be correct? And what was happening is that people were not going to A&E when they had chest pains and were ending up dying at home. And that has been shown by the British Heart Foundation to be the case. So even the effect of the pandemic is causing people to not seek medical help and will die. People might have a lump and don't go to their GPs because it's, it's, um, COVID, it's the pandemic and it's difficult to get an appointment with your GP. And you may fare worse with a cancer that you would have normally have done well with. So oh. even if you don't die from it, the effects of it is making us generally fare worse. And we just need to bear that in mind. As but well. Dr. Carroll, let's be, I, can I be honest, guys? I throw a lot of my patients out right now. Um, you, you? I throw, okay, I shouldn't say like that, there's people watching. I try to get people home. If st Some people come to hospital with trivial situations. I have patients that are in, okay, I understand. You see, not everybody is physical. Some things are social. Mm -hmm. Some little old people are alone at home and are bored at home and have nobody at home. And hospital is nicer for them because they have a nice clean environment, have one little old biddy there and one little old biddy there and have people that they can talk to. And sometimes I have a patient that might have came in with a migraine and I'm like, you're medically fit for discharge. And he's like, oh, 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 I feel a little bit busy. I'm like, no, you're medically fit for discharge. And I have to stress the point sometimes that the hospital is a breeding ground right now. Absolutely. Yeah. And a lot of the, the transmission right now is in hospital. And I, I, I say it all the time and I say it again, I do not like clinical site managers because they move patients around, they see beds, they don't see patients and they're just moving patients around and then moving the patients around, they bring one down that's positive and make my whole bay into contacts and then positive and positive. So my thing is with people that I understand why they said there's lower admissions because people are scared to go into hospital. Because when you go into hospital, you move down to certain wards and you put on a cohort ward and everybody's swabbed initially and you don't know who you're next to and that one next to you is positive. And then now you become a contact and then you become positive and then you die of corona. And so that's the, point, the point is well made, Dr. Mike, that even if you don't initially, have, if you didn't initially have COVID because of the whole COVID thing, you might end up you get COVID. Dying. <laughs> so this is why people are not so going is, into hospital. It is real and it is affecting death rates, whichever way you look at it. It is. It is. So people, are, yeah. I, I, so I'm understanding why people are not going. But let's be honest, as a medical mm -hmm. professional, if you are experiencing chest pain and stuff, you have to go into hospital, regardless of Corona. If you are experiencing chest pain and you could be having a heart attack, you can't stay at home with that. You have to go into hospital. Well, thank you both. Um, Sister Sandra, uh, somebody would like to know whether or not they are still in the will of God by taking the vaccine. So what I might say about this in Proverbs 3 verse 5 and 6, it, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not onto your own understanding in all thy ways acknowledge him and he will direct our path. In Romans 8, it says uh, we are predestinated, which means that God knew us even before we knew ourselves. And in Jeremiah 1, Jeremiah says that I was formed in my mother's womb. And um, before I was formed in my mother's womb, God knew him. Um, Hosea 4 verse 6 tells us my people perish because of lack of knowledge. So it, it is um, within God's will um, it was in God's will that um, he, he breathed um, breath into Adam and he made Eve so that um, Adam would not be on her, his own. Uh, God is omniscient, so he's the all-knowing God. He knew that the pandemic would have um, come around 
and uh, Luke um, in the Bible is a physician. God knows that also. And God has also made scientists and doctors to find cures uh, for these diseases. Uh, we've found cures um, for lots of diseases. And then we have uh, vaccinations for influenza. Every year we have to have our flu jab. So, you know, we, we take paracetamol for a headache and we take uh, cough mixtures, um, you know, if we've got a bit of a cough. Uh, we have lots of medical interventions here that can assist us um, in what we need to do to help us to get better. Psalm um, 51 verse 7, David said, purge me with hyssop, which is a plant used uh, for clean, a cleaning agent. Um, and then in Revelation 22 verse 1 to 2, it tells us the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nation, which indicates to us we are able to use what God has given us for healing purposes. And in 2 Kings 4 verse um, 38 to 41, it tells us that Elisha told the sons of the prophets to put on the pot and gather some herbs, but one went out and got a wild vine and put it in the pot. And whilst they were eating, they cried out, saying, there is death in the pot. And Elisha said, bring meal. Then uh, he put this into the pot and no harm came to anyone. This shows us that there was one who did not have an understanding and there was one that did have understanding. And um, we, we, were, we are told in Proverbs uh, 1 verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and fools despise wisdom and instruction. And in verse five, it tells us a wise man will hear and increase in learning and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. Solomon tells us there's nothing new under the sun. And what we should do is um, continue to be under the will of God. Today, we're given lots of instruction, lots of knowledge. And then it's up to um, the person, the individual, whether they would like to take the vaccine or not. Oh, excellent. Thank you so much. And also, um, just Sandra, what are the medical indications for taking the vaccine? So, yes, as I mentioned before, uh, the contraindications are things like um, a fever, a high fever. You could have a very awful headache. You can have um, feeling very generally unwell, like you've got the flu and you can feel um, your arm can hurt you for a couple of days and you generally can feel sort of really severely fatigued. Uh, and those are the main contraindications um, of having the vaccination. And I've had mine and I had all of those. And then I gave it to lots of other people, many people, and some had nothing at all. Some just had a sore arm. Some had a headache and others had nothing at all. Perfect. And also, Sister Sandra, um, will pressure be put on individuals to actually take the vaccine? So um, according to our Prime Minister, he says that the vaccine will not become mandatory. Uh, but you, you may find that when you're going to other countries on holiday, they may ask, for proof that you've had the vaccination and you may actually feel pressurized then, um, but it, at the moment it is not a mandatory vaccination to have. Thank you so much for those wonderful answers. Um, so now we're down to the, the final two questions that we have formally. Um, so between Dr. Cowden and Dr. Mike, explain why there's been a change in the definition of vaccine. There hasn't been essentially a definition, uh, sorry, a change in the definition of vaccine. When we think of vaccine, we think of what we call an antigen. So something that's introduced into our body to trigger our immune system to make antibodies and prepare the other immune cells to fight the pathogen, whether it's a virus or a, or a bacteria, should we come in contact with it. That's essentially so. It trains our body to fight a disease when we get in, in, in contact with it. That's excellent. That's, I'm um, sorry, essentially what vaccine does. What differs, as I've been explaining, is the type of vaccines. And um, we've been using, like I said, live attenuated um, 
pathogens or weakened uh, pathogens or parts of pathogens, but no, we're using a different method, the uh, genetic vaccines. And there are also other ways of making vaccines that are being looked at and are ongoing. And we also need to rem know that this, this uh, method of, for example, the mRNA method of, use, of making vaccine didn't just start when the pandemic started. Before we had SARS-CoV-2, there was SARS-1, and that was in 2003, and then there was MERS. These are all type of coronaviruses. And that prepared scientists started preparing for, for something like, like the pandemic that happened, because it was obvious from history and from how things were behaving, from how viruses were jumping from animals. Um, to human, for example, it was anticipated that this was happening. So in the background, lots of work was being done on developing these vaccines. And once this has been, once it is developed and, and the technique has been, what's the word I'm looking for? Once the technique has been done and it gives, gets the go ahead, it is a matter of what we call plug and play. So using it for something else and can use it again and again and again and again. And so mm -hmm. I think that we're going to see this particular method being used for different, developing different vaccines, maybe even for things like cancer, like Dr. Mike was talking about, because this is a method that has been developed for many years. It's now proven that it has worked and there will be plugging and playing it, using it in other instances. So it's not that vaccine has changed, it's the different methods. And I've only listed a few. There are lots of other methods being worked on to develop vaccines, not just for infectious diseases, but for things like dementia, uh, Parkinson's disease, those sorts of things, cancers, things are being developed through these new ways of making vaccines. And as Sister Sandra said, you know, God has given man knowledge and has provided resources for us to use. And I think it's a good thing that we're using what God has given us. Thank you, Dr. Carol. Um, a massive thank you to the panel for all the, the answers that we've received so far. They've been brilliant. Um, we have the final question, Dr. Mike, and it's in two parts. Um, so the first part is, what is the relationship between COVID-19 and 5G technology? And also, what is the involvement of Bill and Melinda Gates in the COVID-19 vaccine? <laughs> okay, well, Bill and Melinda, I'm not really into the politics. Don't have time to watch politicians and whatever, but anyway. So uh, for um, 5G and coronavirus, let's just scrap that conspiracy right there. It, it's like when it initially came out, everybody was just looking for something to blame. And they wanted to. Play. They've always used mobile phones as the problem for for years. We heard about microwaves before, and that microwaves can cause this. Then we hear that phones can cause cancer. So now we've gone to five G. Now five G is the cause. Now let's let's put it into place. Five G is radio waves. Coronavirus is a a, a virus that is transmitted through is an airborne virus so to speak with droplets 5g cannot transmit that way coronaviruses on surfaces and stuff that is radio waves two different things totally two different things so that conspiracy we might as well just put it in the bin right now there is no correlation studies have been done there's a study been done in nigeria where um they tried to look into it as well and so there's no actual correlation between the radio waves of 5g and the the, the biological aspect of coronavirus two different things so remember let's remember coronavirus is a respiratory disease 5g has nothing to do with breathing let's put it down into that light and just keep it simple there is no correlation there and i think majority of people have actually dropped that conspiracy as time has gone by that was the initial thing in january 2020 people are not really talking about 5g and coronavirus anymore I think that's long time been proven that there's no correlation there. Um, in regards to 
uh, Bill Gates, poor thing. Even my mom was using this one from the WhatsApp videos about Bill Gates. She don't even know who Bill Gates is. And yet she's talking about Bill Gates and the, uh, uh, and the vaccine. That's why she don't take it. And then she ends up in hospital nearly killing herself because of Bill Gates. So with, <laughs> with Bill Gates now, I think where the conspiracy, poor Bill Gates, sometimes he actually does a lot of voluntary work and stuff and tries to sow money. I don't really know much about him. But what, in my research, I think where the conspiracy had really sourced from is there was uh, a, a study that he was funding, him and his wife were funding, in where there was trying to develop an approach where they could encode medical history of a patient uh, into a small amount of dive by using a vaccine. But in this study, it was never studied on. As Dr. Carroll showed that you have phases of a trial and first it's trialed on animals before it goes to humans. It has never been trialed on humans and it's never included hardware technology such as a microchip. To this day, we don't know how to put a microchip into a vaccine. It's never been done. It's never been heard of. So there's, there's the, even that conspiracy. And furthermore, let's take it home. I always have to say this, and I'll say this to you all, guys. I have been taught when I was a kid that the church will get raptured. We sing in the great triumphant morning, number 30 from the Pentecostal hymn book. And the thing is, we sing that song and we believe that the church will be raptured away. Now, Revelation 13, the church is supposed to be raptured and shouldn't even be there. So my question is, guys. If we are going through Revelation 13 and this COVID vaccine is to do with that, where we can't buy, sell, left, whatever, whatever, then that means that all of us got left behind. <laughs> that means we got it wrong. <laughs> so, guys, I and I firmly believe in what I believe in, and I believe that the church will be raptured before we go through all that. So this coronavirus thing has nothing to do with Revelation 13. I mean, Bishop may want to say something more on that, but I'll leave that to the bishop. But to me, I don't believe it has anything to do with Revelation 13. Brilliant. Thank you, Dr. Mike. And once again, thank you to the panel for the, the, the wonderful answers that we have throughout. Um, I will hand back over to Sister Renee. Thank you, Mel. And thank you to our panelists. Um, we've tried to be, well, they've tried to be as um, balanced as they could be. And they've done such a good job um, as to not, uh, you know, insert bias. And I'm hoping that from the conversation that we've had today, that someone can take something from it and, and you know, have a better and deeper understanding and make a more informed decision about what they want to do um, essentially going forward. Um, I'm going, we do have a few questions, some really interesting questions in the chat box. So I'm going to ask Overseer Landau, he's on the line, if we have time for one or two. If we do have one, time for one or two, I'm going to ask our panelists to just answer them in, in a minute or two, if it's a yes or no, if, it, if the answer can be answered in a yes or no even better, but I'm going to essentially ask him if that's okay. Um, we've already taken two and a half, it's almost two and a half hours, so I'm sure that everybody that has stayed on, um, if you've got two or three more questions from the chat box, it's best to try and get um, deal with them if, whilst we have the panelists here. Okay, um, let's go through them then. Okay, so Sister, Sister Vanessa has asked, which is a very important question, have there been many teenage deaths from COVID? She says the kids go back to school and this is a concern. Does the death rate reflect this as the youth are considered as the most common transmitters? Um, have there been many teenage deaths from COVID? And does okay, the like death rate reflect this? Thank you. I haven't seen one teenager die as the cause of COVID. However, I've had a 39-year-old die from her son, who was 10, gave her COVID. So children are carriers, and I guess children can deal with COVID better being younger. They can deal with it, so they probably have milder symptoms, or maybe asymptomatic, but it doesn't stop them from carrying it and passing it on. So they do pass it on. Okay, thank officially, you. Officially, it's the older people who die mostly, who are most at risk, not the younger. So officially, there have not been many deaths, children and stroke teenagers' deaths. 
Thank you. But like, like Mike said, they can they are carriers and can pass it on. So, yeah. but with these new strains, I noticed with this new strain in this 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 wave, it is taking younger. When I say younger, I mean forties and fifties are on CPAP now. So in the first wave, you're seeing more older people. Now I'm seeing thirty forties and fifties with less comorbidities. So I guess the newer strain, like the South African, may be coming where it's affecting people with less comorbidities. Not exactly causing deaths, but they're being admitted. Yes. Okay, thank you. In, in one or two sentences, can we um, reiterate the long-term effects, if there are, there are any known side effects? Um, and I presume this is about the, the vaccine rather than COVID-19. So long-term effects will come about either because there are greater numbers of people who have been vaccinated and so rare effects are shown up or as a result of time, something develops because of time. In terms of the greater number of people who've been vaccinated and demonstrating long um, serious side effects, I think we can be reasonably comfortable now because we've had over 40 million people in the world so far have had the vaccine, plus those who were in the trials, and we haven't seen any bizarre side effects. And when the vaccines were being developed, the FDA was adamant that they needed um, two months of safety data before they would approve it, and they had two lots of two months, because what has been shown throughout history is that any significant side effects from vaccines um, tend to show up sort of over a, a two month period. I'm not sure if that is because of the numbers that cum accumulate in that period. So the safety signature sort of gives its stamp over that period. And we've had ample time in terms of the trials and now in terms of the number of people who've been vaccinated and we've not seen any bizarre side effects, but in terms of time, something developing as a result of time, that is still an unknown. But I think we can be, you know, we can be reasonably um, comfortable that the, there are lots of um, safety data from the numbers so far. Thank you. Can I just, can I just quickly say, uh, uh, Sister Paula said, I have to agree what is now. So she's alliterating what I've said, that she's seeing younger people in this wave coming through the wards now. So I'm just shout, saying out to people, don't feel that just because you're 13 or 40, and you're not 60, 70, 80, that you don't need the vaccine and you don't have diabetes and whatever, because it is affecting, like I said, younger and less comorbidities now. So just remember that, keep that in mind. Okay, I think there's what, this is another question I've seen, and I think it might be the last one that I can see. Um, it has been answered in the chat, but just in case anybody hasn't seen the answer, I'm gonna pose it out to the, the panelists. Um, it's from Brother Earl Clark. Do we know what percentage of current infections are caused by new variants? I don't think we know the actual um, percentage of infections that have been caused by the new virus, the new um, variant. We do know that certainly the the B one one seventeen, the one that was identified in Kent, is such that it is it causes the virus to be more transmissible. So if more people are getting it, then it stands to reason that more people will be infected, probably get severe disease, and probably die eventually, even though it is not thought to be more virulent in terms of yeah. killing people. Yeah. And I think it's the same with the others. And that is why they are of concern, because if nothing else, they seem to be more, trans they cause more transmissible um, disease. Thank you. We do have a few hands up. Um, one from Sister Paulette Parks. I, she, there isn't a question in the chat, but um, if you can unmute, you can take it. No, your... it's okay. It's just um, just confirm agreeing with Dr. Mike, to be honest, because across the, the six wards that I work, across San Juan and West Midlands, um, there was a lot, particularly in the San Juan area, of young people coming in. Um, of the thir age 30s and it was a great concern so a lot of the older folks were moved to our wards to accommodate those there so so a lot of young people are being affected now 
Okay, thank you for that. And I think that's all the questions that I can see, I've seen in the chat. If I've missed any questions, I do apologize. Um, but now for the sake of time, I am going to hand over to our overseer, Andrew Landell. Thank you. Amen, amen. God bless you amen. as panelists, um, Dr. Mike, Dr. Carol, um, Nurse Sandra, um, Sister Melissa and, and, and Renee, who are PhD students at this time. God bless you. Truly, um, this has been, um, I'm, I'm just thankful for the amount of folks that have been on throughout the, the last two and a half hours. It's obvious that you guys can, can keep a crowd, um, <laughs> having kept us um, um, watching and listening. And, and the information has been invaluable. Um, so I'm thanking you for that. Hopefully, at least one person tonight has got a better understanding to make an informed decision as to whether they're going to take um, a vaccine or not. From a spiritual perspective, um, let me say I give God thanks for the days of fasting and the days of prayer that the church has been putting down for our frontline medical staff because when there was no um, AstraZeneca, when there was no um, Pfizer-BioNTech, thank God we had the Holy Ghost that was covering you all out there. And, um, and for that, um, until now, um, we still have our faith. We still have our belief. Um, yes, the idea for today is that hopefully um, when everybody reconsiders whatever they're going to do, they're going to make an informed decision as to how they go forward. So God bless you. Thank you all very much. And thank you for all the attendees this evening. There's a number of medical professionals that are on uh, Zoom this evening and we give God thanks for you all. I, I even recognize some faces from, from across the Atlantic Ocean. So God bless you um, for joining us today. And uh, no, none of our uh, meetings like this would be um, completed without a benediction. So let's take it from the book of Jude this evening. And now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening.